Would you pray with me, please? Most holy and loving God, be with us this evening. Open our hearts and our minds Amen. to you and to the movement of your Holy Spirit. <coughs> be with us and guide us. Sponsor in us quickening spirits alive to your presence and to your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I wanted to start with another scripture this evening from uh, the book of Ezekiel. Sorry, the uh, book of Ecclesiastes. Forgive me. And uh, if I can find it. Uh, let's have a look. Ecclesiastes. And I think, if I remember, it's uh, chapter 3. And the writer of Ecclesiastes wrote there, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to seek from embracing, a time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain have workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given everyone to be busy with. God has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, God has put a sense of past and future into our minds. And yet, we cannot find out what God has done from the beginning up until the end. I had that in mind when I read the lectionary reading today from 1 Kings, which is the, the reading that, uh, that Nigel read earlier, because that's a little bit of a much larger story, some of which you might be familiar with. And it's, it's part of the story of the prophet Isaiah. And... The bit that happened before that is that um, there's been a famine in Israel for about three and a half years and a drought. There's been no rain for about three years. And King Ahab, who has married Jezebel, remember Jezebel? Well, Jezebel was from a place called Sidon. So she was a Phoenician princess. Sidon basically means fishing. And Sidon was the fishing port, which was the capital of Phoenicia. And Phoenicia was the country that Ahab wanted to create an alliance with. And he did that by marrying uh, Jezebel, um, who was the king's daughter. Of course, in the scriptures, it doesn't kind of go very well, because what happens is, is that Jezebel comes in, and in this alliance, she not only brings kind of the wealth of her country and the trading rights, but she also brings their, their god. And their god is called Baal. You've heard of Baal. Or Baal. 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 So she brings the god Baal, Baal with her, and, and a whole load of uh, priests and prophets and all this kind of entourage. And, and what happens is after a while, there's kind of an internal struggle of war, and all the prophets of, of Yahweh get killed off, bar one, and that's, and that's Isaiah. And the, the name Jezebel basically means, um, where are you, Baal, or where are you, Lord? Because um, part of their, their yearly ritual was that they believed that at certain parts of the year, the god Baal went to the underworld. And, of course, when the god was in the underworld, you couldn't contact god. So you had this special ritual, which was, where are you, god? Oh, you're down there. And, and Jezebel just means, where are you? It's kind of interesting. But anyway. Um, so, so what happens is, is that um, Isaiah manages to send a message to King Ahab 
via a guy called Obadiah. You heard of Obadiah? Okay, so, so Obadiah is somebody who works within the palace, um, but he's kind of an Israelite, and he's, he's a Yahweh uh, supporter on the QT. Um, in fact, he's hidden priests in caves to keep them alive. Um, so he's kind, of, he's kind of a good guy. And Isaiah goes to him and says, look, go to the king, tell him I want to meet with him, and that, um, and that God's going to make it rain. And Obadiah's like, no, if I do that, they're going to kill me. You know, as soon as I mention your name, that's it. You know, and, and Isaiah says, no, you'll be fine. God said to do it. Go and, go and see Ahab and just tell him. So he goes and tells Ahab and, and says, look, I'll meet you. I'll meet you um, at the foot of Mount Horeb. And Mount Horeb, by the way, is where Moses got the Ten Commandments from. So he, they go down to, to Mount Horeb, and there's, there's Isaiah on his own. Sorry, not Isaiah. Um, um, it's not Isaiah. Who Ezekiel. Is it? No, it's not Ezekiel. <laughs> it's um, the prophet. So the prophet's there. <laughs> I've completely lost this thing. Isaiah. Um, Isaiah, thank you, yes. It's, no, it's not it's no, Isaiah. Isaiah. No, it's not. It's Elijah. Elijah, thank you. <laughs> Elijah, Elijah, thank you. It's Elijah. So Elijah says, <laughs> talk about losing the plot. I thought this was on my head. So Elijah gets down there and meets them down there. And of course, he's on his Todd with his, with his one servant. And there's about 150 of the, the priests of Baal. And, and he says to the king, look, um, I'm going to make it rain. But before I do so, we need to determine which God is the powerful God because um, uh, otherwise, when it rains, then all the priests of Baal will just say, our God did it, and who's to know? So he says, right, what we'll do is we'll, we'll each sacrifice something to our God and see which God responds. So the priests of Baal create this great big altar. They take a poor cow and kill it and put it on the top, and then they, uh, they dance around all day as is kind of their... their their way of worship, and they, they cut themselves with knives, because they, they like to do that, and, um, and they, they kind of wail and make noises, and they're doing this all day, and, and Elijah, um, you know, I, one of the things I like about Elijah is I think he's bipolar, um, and, and I'll explain that later, and I don't mean that in a funny way, I just mean if you read the story, uh, because he's, he's kind of sat there, and he watches them all doing this, and he says, uh, oh, is your God not answering you? Maybe, maybe you ought to shout a bit louder. Maybe, maybe God's on the toilet. Maybe God's in the bathroom and you need to make a racket because then God will hear you. And so, you know, he kind of, he whips them all up into a frenzy and, and, and nothing happens. So what he does is he, he goes to the original altar, which was the, the altar to Yahweh, Jehovah, the, the original one. And he takes 12 big stones and puts those around representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then builds on top of that, puts lots of wood on, and then, then he makes a moat around the outside, and he <coughs> orders that, that the sacrifice be placed on the top, and lots of water poured over the sacrifice until it fills the moat, and, and then what he does is he stands back, and he prays, and he says, <coughs> and out, out of heaven comes this fire that just consumes the whole sacrifice, consumes everything. At which point, Elijah... Not satisfied with, hey, so you see which God's the true God, says to all the people, because you can imagine half of Israel have come out to watch this, says to all the people, you see which God is, is, our, is the right God, not their God, get them, kill them. And the people fall on the priests and kill them all. So, a bit OTT, but that's what Elijah does. <laughs> so, anyway, he kind of, he, he leaves there and, and he goes up Mount Horeb with his, with his um, servant. And he starts praying, and he says to his servant, look out, look out to sea, and just tell me what, what, you can, what you can see. And he starts praying, and he turns around, and he says, so what can you see? And the servant says, nothing. So he turns around and starts praying again. And he turns around and says, what can you see? And the servant says, nothing. And then uh, on the seventh time he does it, he turns around and says, what can you see? And the servant says, I can see a little cloud in the distance. It's about the size of a fist. At which point he says, okay, go and tell the king. You better move now, otherwise... The rain is going to be so hard, he's not going to be able to leave here. So, obviously, they go back, and everything seems to be all hunky-dory. Uh, Elijah's kind of, you know, the, 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 the man of the moment. He's, he's the one with all the power and everything. And he gets back, and, and what he finds out is that Jezebel has heard about 
what happened at Mount Horeb, has heard that all of the priests have been killed, um, and says, right, I'm not having all my priests killed, that's completely out of order, I'm putting a price on his head, basically I want Elijah dead by the end of the day, that's it. So Elijah makes a run for it, and by the end of the following day, he leaves, he's left his servant behind, he's wandered into the desert, and by the end of that day, he sat, he sat under a broom tree, and he's saying to God, just kill me. Just kill me. I mean, seriously, and my life's just not worth anything. I can't believe it. It's just nothing goes right for me. Everything goes wrong for me. It's just, it's the worst thing, which is why I kind of say he's bipolar, because I understand that. Because one minute, literally, he's on top of the world, and the next minute, he's asking God to kill him. Because he's just, he's either up here, or he's down there. I mean, yeah, I, I get that. So... So what happens is he falls asleep under the broom tree. Just by the way, broom trees are really interesting trees because uh, in, in the Middle East what they do is they, they use the wood for, for fires. Um, and the, the wood has a unique property in that um, after the fire's gone out, the embers hold their heat for a long, long time. Um, so what they tend to do is they, they, um, uh, they make a fire and then when the fire's gone out, they take the embers and they spread them kind of in a body shape size on the sand, cover them with a couple of inches of sand, and then sleep on it, and it keeps you warm during the night. It's, and, and I don't know why they call it a broom tree, but the examples I've seen, they look like big brooms. They're kind of like, like a big straight tree, and then like a big bush kind of hanging off the edge or hanging off the side. They kind of look like one of the old sweeping brooms. So, so anyway, he's lying under the tree, and um, wanting to die, and he wakes up, and there's an angel there. Uh, somebody's baked bread, left water for him, and says, come on, eat. And he does. And then he falls back asleep again. And when he wakes up again, there's more bread and there's more water. And he says, come on, drink and eat, because you'll need this for the journey. And then it says, it took him 40 days and 40 nights to get back to Mount Horeb. Now, when the Bible uses the number 40, it means something special. When the Bible uses the number 40, it basically means that enough time has passed for a complete change to take place. So, for example, um, at the, um, in the flood, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And then uh, Moses was 40 years old when, when he fled Egypt. He was then uh, another 40 years before he came back, and another 40 years before they entered the Promised Land. Uh, the Bible uses 40 to, to show that a period of time has elapsed. Jesus, of course, goes off into the desert 40 days and 40 nights. Um, the Bible uses the number 40 to show that a period of time has elapsed enough for, for a complete change to take place. And then what happens next is, he's up on the mountain, and there's this huge fire that engulfs everything, and of course we hear that God wasn't found in the fire. There was an earthquake, and God wasn't found in the earthquake. And then there was a huge wind that, that ran through everything, and he says that God wasn't in the wind, and then it says there's a sheer silence. You know the scripture, don't you? There's a sheer silence, and God was in the silence. It's interesting, his life, because the book of Kings is, is, what's, called, is what's called a historical novel. So we, we like to think of it as being kind of history and just facts, but actually it's more than that. To say that it's just a history book I think is very unfair, because it's actually a, a novel based on historical events to teach lessons. And one of the lessons that we have in this is that, uh, first of all, to have Elijah's up here, and then he's down here, and then he's back up here again, and, and his, his life, even over short periods of time, is kind of up and down and up, and, and you, you can't tell what's going to happen next. You'd think that, that after the incident at Mount Horeb, when, when it's rained, and he's brought rain to a land that's been suffering from drought, when there's been this extraordinary uh, display of power, when God's fire has come down and consumed the sacrifice, you'd think at that point he'd be set. That at that point, everything would be going well for him, that everything would be right for him from that moment on. But actually, less than 24 hours later, he's in the desert wanting to die. And I think for me what it does is, it reminds me that at each and every part of this journey, uh, God was with uh, Elijah. Although, of course, at times, it didn't feel like it to Elijah. 
when Elijah was in the desert wanting to die, it didn't feel like God was with him in the way that God was with him when he called fire from heaven or, or predicted it was going to rain. God certainly wasn't with him in the way that he discovered God in the silence later on. And yet, when he went to sleep and woke up, there was an angel there that provided for him. And I think the, the lesson in this for me is that no matter where you are, whether life's up here and everything's trolling along nicely, or whether it's down here and it's all problematic, when you're up here, it's very easy to think about God's presence and to feel God's presence and to understand that God's in the center of it all. It's really difficult when we're down here to understand that actually God is with us in exactly the same way. And I think one of the things that Elijah's life does is that that story shows us that God's presence is there throughout all of it, regardless how we feel about it. And then, in our dark moments, that brings us hope. Amen. Amen.